Um, I want to welcome you to TCG's 25th National Conference. Yep. And welcome to Cleveland. You know, it's been 39 years. It was 39 years ago that 215 theater people gathered for four days on Yale's campus for the very first TCG National Conference. At that time, their discussions ranged from artistic policy to fundraising strategies, from the role of music in productions to the role of theater in communities. That conference really launched the biannual and now annual TCG tradition of convening the field. Coming together now for the 25th time, we honor the game-changing leaders who saw the power of peer connection to make, in the words of TCG's vision statement, a better world for theater and a better world because of theater. Here with us today, we have at least two theater leaders who attended that first gathering at Yale, the amazing David Hawkinson and Woody King Jr. <laughs> Feel free. We're going to hear from them in a bit. Um, but I also want to mention that we have leaders here who are here for the very first time. It's their first conference. And in order to, yes, we can clap for those people as well. <laughs> but to honor this intergenerational legacy, we'll be sharing key memories from, the, from conferences past throughout our three days together. And there is perhaps no greater defining story than the one I'm going to share with you now. August Wilson's first conference was in 1984, just a few months after his production of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom had been at Yale Repertory Theater. Our publisher, Terry Nimick, was tasked with talking to artists who didn't seem to know anyone. And so he approached the emerging playwright as he stood off to the side watching a cocktail reception underway. As always, August was dressed in a coat jacket with a vest, a tie, and a hat. And Terry remembers that it had just been announced that Ma Rainey was going to Broadway. Twelve years later, on the Princeton campus, August stood on our plenary stage at the McCarter and delivered his game-changing keynote address, The Ground on Which I Stand. That was my first TCG conference, and I still remember everyone leaping to their feet for a standing ovation. Nine years after that, at our 2005 conference in his adopted home town of Seattle, August signed copies of his first TCG published play, King Hedley II, for over an hour in spite of not feeling well. It was at that conference that he finally agreed to let TCG publish all 10 of his plays in the century cycle. So we are joining here together on hallowed ground. It's made sacred by the game-changing vision of August Wilson and the thousands of theater people who have gathered over the past 24 conferences. And as we honor that legacy, we must also call the emerging artists and leaders who, like a young Wilson, may stand a little outside of things wondering how they fit in. So we are asking you, how will you shake the ground on which we stand? Over the next three days, what game-changing moments can we make together? How can we extend those questions to those watching the conference on live stream? Thank you, HowlRound. <laughs> And now I'd like to acknowledge uh, that this time together would not be possible without the support of our wonderful conference sponsors. I'd like to take some time to name them and I ask you to hold your applause until the end. The City of Cleveland, the Cleveland Foundation, Cleveland State University, Destination Cleveland, the Edgerton Foundation, the George Gund Foundation, Intrinsic Impact by Wolf Brown, Jack Prince, Key Bank Foundation, the Kulas Foundation, MailChimp, John P. Murphy Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, the Nord Family Foundation, Patron Technology, Playhouse Square, the Ruth Easton Fund, Spectrix, and Westlake Reed Laskowski. Thank you to all of our conference supporters. The names on that list represent just a small measure of the profound support that we've received from the Cleveland theater community. Over the next three days, you'll get a small taste of the strength and diversity of this community, which itself is celebrating the 100-year anniversaries of Karamu House, 
the oldest continually operating theater of color in the country, and the Cleveland Playhouse, which is this year, this year received the Regional Theater Tony Award. To help me honor this amazing city and acknowledge the work of our tireless Cleveland host committee, please join me in welcoming Bob Taylor and Raymond Bob Gann to the stage. Hello, everybody. My name is Bob Taylor. I'm the executive director of Great Lakes Theater. And on behalf of the host committee, welcome to Cleveland. We're so glad to have you where the sun always shines. I just wanted to say that I think it is so special that we are holding our first plenary session here in the Ohio Theater. The Ohio Theater was the very first theater restored in the Playhouse Square District in 1982. And Great Lakes Theater moved from its west side suburban location to move down here and become the first resident company of Playhouse Square. So over the past 33 years, our organization has witnessed this incredible transformation to the gem that you guys have seen when you arrived this week. So thanks to Playhouse Square for sharing all these gorgeous theaters with us for a theater uh, conference. Isn't that wonderful? Thanks, Playhouse Square. Uh, we are really blessed in this community also to have a wide panoply of theaters available to us. Um, we have a varied, a, a, a wide variety of sensibility, of talent, of taste. Um, we have legacy theaters, we have new kids on the block, and all of us are working together and separately sometimes to serve the um, varied needs of our diverse community. So we're very fortunate to have that community. And our host theater group, um, has been working the past 15 months with TCG to create a, an experience, a representative experience, both of our city and of our theater community, and which we hope will be both pleasurable and fun and memorable to all of you. So thank you for being with us um, here. Um, it is my pleasure to thank the host theaters that have worked so hard again over the last 15 months. So if I could ask the host theater board members, staffs, and artists that are here today to just stand. I just want to recognize you so you guys can be recognized. If you guys could just raise, stand up for a second. And again, this... Amen. This group represents... As Teresa said, both our centenary theaters, Caramu House and the Cleveland Playhouse, but also theaters with other very strong histories. Dobama Theater has been around for 56 years. Great Lakes Theater for 54, Cleveland Public Theater 31, and then the new kid on the block, Theater Ninjas, five years young, right? So it's a great, great group of people. I'm grateful to work in this community every day. And thank you all for everything you done to bring, did to bring this conference here, for the celebration of our art form that you, that, you do, that you work in every day, and for the richness you bring to our community. It's fantastic to be, have you here. So thanks so much. And finally, it's my pleasure to rec recognize a man who exemplifies our art form every single day, and my friend, Raymond Bobkin, the Executive Artistic Director of Cleveland Public Theater. Thanks, Raymond. Okay, so uh, I imagine that some of you are still thinking, really, Cleveland? <laughs> because that's what I was thinking 20 years ago when I stopped off here, what I thought temporarily, for a couple of years. Um, but what I found here was an incredible community, um, a community that values kindness and has a strange um, deep sense of civic pride but also civic participation. A city that has played um, such an important role in the history of our country in so many areas but especially in the area of diversity. Um, and what I also found is that here artists really are celebrated. Um, we just have such an incredible history and that as an artist I could play a role in the community, in a very, very interconnected community that has incredible need for the arts, but also welcomes them in to really address critical issues and to remind us all of our true purpose. Um, tonight, uh, you will get a sense, I think, of that Cleveland. Um, you'll get an opportunity at the opening night party to experience not only Cleveland Public Theater, but dozens 
of other theaters, dance uh, groups, performing artists, and uh, musicians, all from the Cleveland area. Um, there will be lots of food. Stay late. There will be lots of drink. And uh, this night is going to be based on our annual extravaganza, Pandemonium. Pandemonium at TCG is sort of a mini pandemonium, but it's unlike any opening party that you have ever experienced, I am guessing. So you have to gear up your adventurous spirit. You have to nurture curiosity. You may encounter a play by Eric Koble on a staircase, uh, or you might meet a goddess in a closet, or a ninja in a cabaret, or perhaps um, you will experience a revelation in an elevator. And at 9 p.m., the desserts will arrive from three great Cleveland favorite places, and then it's dancing with the pink elephants. You'll understand that later. Uh, <laughs> the party goes to 11 p.m. for those of you who are Cleveland tough. Now, <laughs> it's my honor and uh, privilege to introduce my friend and truly one of my heroes, Joe Simperman. Joe is the councilman of Ward 3. We're in his ward right now, but he works across the city. Um, Ten years ago, CPT uh, had lost a significant funder for our teen program, STEP, where we employ very, very low-income youth. Um, it, we employ them over the course of the summer to write and produce their own plays and perform them at city parks. And uh, Joe had um, helped out a little bit that summer, and uh, he called me up and said, we're ready to go. And I said, I just don't know if we can actually go forward. And he said, let's meet. And he said, what do you need me to do? And he led an effort to not only save the program, but to make it sustainable. And this is, this is just one of the many things Joe has done. He um, led le legislation to have a same-sex registry in the city of Cleveland. He, yes, he, he also led the effort, along with my councilman, Matt Zone, to make sure that city employees who are in same-sex, um, who are registered as same-sex couples can get equal health benefits. And he has also a added transgender to one of the protected groups in the city and continues to fight every day. <laughs> and, and I could go on and on. Um, this is just a snapshot of his leadership um, to build a more fair and equitable city. This man, he is the real deal. He gets it. He understands, he advocates loud, loudly, but most importantly, he walks the walk, the amazing Joe Simperman. Love you, Love you. Love you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. And welcome to the great city of Cleveland. As a son of the city of Cleveland, I have to do this appropriately. On behalf of Mayor Frank G. Jackson, the 56th mayor of the city of Cleveland, and on behalf of Council President Kevin J. Kelly, welcome to the great city of Cleveland established in 1796. <laughs> now that that's done, uh, and now let me speak to you as your brother. I am so deeply moved by each and every one of your presence here and knowing that I won't be able to introduce myself to each and every one of you, let me, on behalf of somebody who grew up in a family with issues on a street that was numbered, it wasn't named after an animal or a botanical garden, as somebody who didn't know what it was like to dream or imagine until I had the chance to work with people in your field, thank you. Thank you for opening doors that are closed that we call closets. Thank you for opening minds for people, some of us in our own room, who change when we see things happening before us. Thank you for being the force of good and light and love in a nation that right now is desperate for good and light and love. I say this to you, I say this to you because you guys are awesome, and you guys are fun, and you are going to have such a great time. But it is so rare that I get to actually tell the honest-to-God truth in my job. 
and I'm not going to pass up this minute. <laughs> Thank you for changing communities, communities that you're going to visit, communities where storefronts were boarded until places like Cleveland Public Theater working collaboratively with Great Lakes, with Playhouse Square, with performers from Karamu, with places like Near West Theater were able to transform an entire neighborhood and an entire community and make it safer and better for young people and yes, for people who never have yet bought a ticket. Thank you for changing places like neighborhoods where we have young people who are coming from all different backgrounds, performing in neighborhoods of all different backgrounds with programs like the STEP program that Cleveland Public Theater does, but also another program called Y Haven where men who are recovering put on their own performance and tour how appropriately before and after the holiday of American Thanksgiving here in Cleveland to speak the truth. And thank you for being so relevant in this time of discordance in our nation. When it is so hard for us to be honest about our past and our present, and we only need to realize that we aren't going anywhere until we do that. And I'm in a room right now, I'm in a room right now with 800 people who are reminding us that there is only one way forward, and that's the truth. That's the truth. This past year, we had the privilege through Cleveland Public Theater and Raymond's direction to enliven a church for the second time in two years that was one of the most, most northern termini of the Underground Railroad, a place called Station Hope. It was a church that had been shuttered. It was a church that nobody knew the history of until a group of 150 people like you and you and you came to this quiet place, opened the doors, and said, this is the story of Cleveland and freedom. This is the story of Cleveland and freedom of when people treated each other as human beings and not as people who were part of one racial group or another. This is the story of the city of Cleveland when police officers in the time of Cleveland's founding actually aided abolitionists who were taking people who were coming from the South to get out of this country that had backwards views and horrific places where people died and took them to better places. This was a place that was in the middle of the city that nobody knew about until people like you opened the door and said welcome. You said welcome. You said welcome to a person who was 12 years old, whose mother spent six months in the hospital as somebody struggling with bipolar disorder. You said welcome to somebody who grew up on a numbered street, who didn't know, wasn't focused, was failing out of school, and brought that person into theater. You said welcome to someone who when they were in high school, played Jerry in the zoo story and Cheswick in One Flew the Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> and that person still uses those phrases in city council meetings every single day. Because sometimes, my friends, you have to go a very long distance out of the way in order to come back a short distance correctly. A little Edward Albee action there. But you said, welcome to me. And I'm going to say this to you because the person who brought me up in theater was a wonderful man named Pierre Davignon, who passed away this past spring. And I didn't get a chance to ever have this conversation because he was too sick by the time I realized he was dying. But had it not been for him, and had it not been for people like you across this country, there would be people who wouldn't know what it meant to be loved, what it meant to feel goodness, and what it meant to feel what it's like when you're alive. I know who you are. I know exactly who you guys are. You guys are the ones who help people like me that you never know you helped, but without you, we wouldn't be here. So welcome to this great city. We love you. Have a great time. One last thing, sorry. On behalf of the city of Cleveland, Teresa is now the councilwoman for all things theater in Cleveland.
fantastic. By the way, thank you, Bob and Raymond, and thank you, Councilman Simperman. And by the way, Councilman Simperman has been tweeting um, the proceedings. So check out hashtag TCG15. There's a really sexy picture of me and Bob and Raymond backstage <laughs> that you'll get to see. And now, um, to present the first of three awards that we're giving over the course of the conference, I'd like to welcome two of those 1976 conference attendees you heard of earlier uh, to the stage, David Hawkinson and Woody King. I just want to clarify something before we start. I think I'm speaking for both Woody and myself. We were at that conference by accident, and we were at this conference by accident. But I want to make it clear, we are not the survivors of the fucking conference, okay? <laughs> there, there are scores of active and vital people around this country that were at that conference. <laughs> they are all in assisted care homes, but there are scores of them. Thank you, Teresa. <laughs> so today we're talking about TCG Visionary Game Changer Award. I'm going to read this thing because it gets a little redundant. Uh, to the individual who has gone above and beyond the call of duty to advance the field as a whole, nationally and inter or internationally, individuals who regularly and beyond think beyond the, the, the envelope to implement practices, new models, advocacy efforts on behalf of the field. Today, G uh, TCG is honoring Jim Houghton. Houghton. Um, my dear friend and, and a man I most admire. Jim has worn many hats in his career. He started as an actor. We both worked with the acting company thousands of years ago. He's a director, producer, he's an educator, he's the head of the Juilliard drama program right now. He's worked on other similar, when he's over the life of his signature life, I actually never could figure out how he did it. He worked on a lot of other similar initiatives like the New Harmony Project, he ran the O'Neill Center. He was artistic advisor to Joe Dowling at the Guthrie where we worked together. Um, but today's honor is not about all of that. It's about what Jim has done for the signature. The signature started in a small storefront in 1991 in Lower Manhattan. Later on, it went to the public. Well, let me say this. It started with, the, from the beginning, its focus was on the playwright. And in, in the very beginning, the focus was on presenting each year one playwright and a body of his or her work. They've never veered away from that. Then he went to the public, and then in his seventh season, he got the wonderful little Peter Norton Theater on 42nd Street. Um, the um, thing that's so amazing, Jim is one of the, this is a non sequitur, Jim is one of the best fundraisers in our field. And he's one of the best fundraisers in our field because he's so passionate and so consistent and so on the mark all the time when he talks about what he's trying to accomplish. And the amazing thing to me about this company is never veered from that. It's, it's done some really interesting initiatives over the years. For example, um, in the 10th season, he introduced a legacy program which is inviting back its past playwrights and residents to return to, their, to the stage either new works or, or, or old known works. In the 15th season, he introduced a very controversial uh, signature ticket initiative that was offering tickets at starting at $20 to, to all performances, making the playwrights work more accessible to the community at large. In the 18th season, he hosted the historic Negro Ensemble Company and presented a whole year of their incredible body of work back from the 80s, I think it was. And then in the 20th season, he launched this, opened this incredible performing arts center. Three theaters, offices, studios, restaurants. But uh, it was not just the fact that it was such an interesting multiplex space that we all dream about having, it, it's that, it, it's, it, the whole idea was so consistent with what he's always tried to do with his company. He wanted a space for a cross-section of artists, audiences, co and community members to experience the theater and each other. And the space does it brilliantly. Woody, do you want to make some comments? <laughs> I'm done. They brought me out here to make some comments, too. Um, <laughs> in 2012, Signature Theater opened its 66th million dollars, 70,000 square foot Persian Square Signature Center at 480 West 42nd Street. It's a three theater complex designed by lead designer Frank Gehry, including office spaces, rehearsal spaces, and a cafe. It is a theater space in New York comparable to the National Theater in London. The cafe 
of which I often hold my meetings, over coffee and uh, browse the uh, collection of plays by signature theater playwrights only. What I know is signature theater makes its tickets affordable, probably the lowest tickets um, in New York. What I know is Jim's commitment to African-American playwrights, August Wilson, Katuri Hall, Regina Taylor, Adrian Kennedy, Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, who was reviewed in today's Times brilliantly, uh, by the way, uh, is incomparable. Jim's commitment to Ruben Santiago Hudson's resulted in major revivals of August Wilson's work, The Piano Lesson, and Athol Fugaz, My Children, My Africa, and a place on the Signature Theater board. I think that's unique. I think that's totally different than most theaters around the country. And Jim Horton, the visionary. And we, we have a short period of time, and we could go on and on with all of his accomplishments. I, I hope you get the gist of why we think this guy is a visionary and change artist. I think the other thing is, what I have to say is, Jim is the most decent, respectful person, not only to artists, but to the people who work for him. He's an incredible man, um, which is why I love him. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot, really. Thank you, guys. You're amazing. You're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, David and Woody. Wow. Um, you guys are rock stars, and you know it, I hope. Um, thank you, Teresa, the board. I'd like to give a shout out to my dear friend, Kate LaPuma, who is not only a trustee of TCG, and the executive director of Chicago's terrific Writers Theater, but she's one of my most cherished friends and colleagues. Many of the things David mentioned about Signature in our earlier years uh, were all seeded or established when Kate was executive director there. So lots of love to you, Kate, and thank you. Thank you. So it's beyond a privilege uh, to be with you all here tonight, honestly. I grew up and was mentored and inspired by the companies and work represented in this room and across the country. I was raised in San Francisco and as a kid I was exposed to the early plays of Sam Shepard at the Magic Theater, the astounding Tony Kushner at the Eureka Theater Company, the eclectic and wonderful work of Berkeley Rep, the crazy Bill Ball at ACT, Luis Valdez at Teatro Campesino, not to mention Beach Blanket Babylon Goes Bananas and <laughs> Bullshot Crumman. And of course, the wonderful Del Arte, Del Arte Company in uh, Blue Lake, California. I travel to Oregon Shakes every year for my annual nine plays in three days chaos and wonder just how they pulled it off. I did trips to the Taper and to La Jolla Playhouse and the Old Globe. I was an actor and a member of the company in the early days of San Jose Rep, which now may explain its demise. Uh, in graduate school, I was in Dallas watching the work of Adrian Hall at the Dallas Theater Center and the beginnings of Undermain Theater and Deep Ellum. As a member of John Hausman's company, the acting company, we traveled across the country bringing Shakespeare, Chekhov, Fornes, and Mark Twain as seen through the eyes of Connie Congdon to eager audiences. We performed in huge off, you know, Broadway-sized theaters to small gymnasiums and small rural communities, places that had felt held fundraisers throughout the year just for the possibility of having a couple of nights of theater. You know, it was that kind of work that we get to do every day. It's the luxury we have. And by some good fortune, work has brought me to nearly every state in this country. And I've been inspired by you and our robust American theatrical landscape. So many of us have collaborated together through New Harmony Project, The O'Neill, The Guthrie, Signature, Juilliard, We've shared in making our work, questioning the work, and nurturing it, and have grown mightily because of it. So this award, this visionary game changer award, is pretty lofty stuff, I would say. And don't get me wrong, I'm very touched to be thought of and to be in your company. But I think all those words relate to results, and that's good. 
but I have to say it's the process of making the work that the fire burns brightly for me and where true change and vision comes to life. You and your collective work are truly the defining vision of our American theater and the thing that is moving the work forward. If there's any game changing going on, it's in every tiny office and intimate stage in every theater in this country where you, you all show up every day dreaming about the impossible and then making it happen one day at a time, one crisis after another, all in the quest to realize the possibility of perhaps one transformative moment where we all rise together and meet our potential, audience and artists alike. That's truly game changing, and that's what you do every day. I know tomorrow Lear is gonna receive an acknowledgement, and I know she shows up every day, not to game change or to have vision. No, she shows up and lives in the moment she's in. And lucky for us, those moments stack up and result in transformative and exciting theater. On a personal note, today is sort of an interesting day for me. This morning, my 20-year-old daughter, Lily, got on a train for a four-day playwriting conference at Yale. She confronted her own fears about it and just applied, and off she went this morning. Brave, brave, brave is what I say. And tonight, my son, Henry, opens in Anything Goes in the After Work Theater in New York City. <laughs> now, there's two things about that. Henry has special needs and has confronted his autism for over 22 years. He's an angel and a champ and a lover of theater. And After Work Theater is the only community theater in New York City, home to over 350 off and off off Broadway theaters. After Work Theater was started about four years ago by a young guy named Evan Greenberg, who wanted to create a safe space where anyone, anyone could be in a play. Everyone pays 500 bucks, that's what funds it, and that's it, they're in. They make theater. And just as the name says, they rehearse after work and on Saturdays. So tonight, they're gonna open up with Anything Goes, and that audience will be filled with friends and colleagues and family. And that stage will be populated by nurses and professors and professionals from every walk of life who happen to be some of the most courageous storytellers you'll ever see. It's incredibly moving and represents the core of what we do and why we do it. We honor each other in this work. And for me, Evan's work and every member of that company is a game changer and a visionary. Transformation and tears will be witnessed tonight in that small, tiny, off-off Broadway theater. So for me, making theater, any theater, is a miracle, truly. And we say level up over the course of this few days. Shoot, I don't know about you guys, but I contend that showing up is the level up. <laughs> That's where we all live every day, where you live every day, where you show up. The act of making theater is by itself aspirational. You are the miracle makers, and I'm very, very, very proud to be part of your community. This gives me a moment to thank you all for your vision and for your truly making it possible that a little boy from San Francisco could be so inspired by you, all of you, to listen to the tiny, tiny voice in his head that just maybe he could find his voice and just maybe be part of your community. So lots of love to all of you and thanks to you for all this honor and the many years of work and the many more years to come and all best wishes for the coming days. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim, for all the work you've done to advance theater and champion this singular voice of the American playwright. While theater may be the oldest form of storytelling, this digital age gives us new platforms for stories seemingly every other week. With the game changing so quickly, 
a sense of humor may be our best navigational tool. That's why I'm pleased to welcome our first plenary speaker to the stage, Baratunde Thurston. Baratunde is a technology-loving comedian who has contributed to Fast Company and NPR, served as director of Digital for the Onion, and authored the New York Times bestseller, How to Be Black. <laughs> he co-founded Cultivated Wit, a startup that exists at the intersection of comedy, creativity, and technology to make the world more fun. Please welcome Baratunde Thurston to the stage. Go for it, man. Yay! Yay! We have this evening learned a few things together about ourselves, about the place that we're in. Uh, we've learned that Cleveland keeps goddesses inside of its closets. <laughs> we have learned that there's always one over-exuberant gentleman in the back of the house excited about the alcohol to be served later. We've learned that the leaders of the theater community in this beautiful and vibrant city have a requirement that their names must contain the name Bob. <laughs> we have learned that politicians are capable of finishing their remarks relatively on time and making great points when they do so. Thanks for restoring our faith, Councilman. It was great. And uh, we've learned that some awards are big, like a visionary award would be big. Other awards are also big, like a game changer award would be pretty massive, but sometimes you have accomplishments so big, you just smash them together <laughs> in a Venn diagram of awesome known as the Visionary Game Changer Award. <laughs> Congratulations, Jim. Congratulations. And we have learned that this gathering is 39 years old, but this gathering is number 25. <laughs> At first, I thought it was a mistake, like a math error. And then I remembered, no, theater people, of course. <laughs> My people, welcome to TCG 15. Give yourselves a big round of applause. So happy to be here. Um, I'm gonna share some stories with you. In, the, in my beginning, which doesn't start with me, uh, it technically starts with this adorable little girl. That's my mother. Uh, Arnita Lorraine Thurston at age four in Washington, D.C., where she was born. Uh, you can see the resemblance. She's adorable. I am also adorable. <laughs> My mother's mother was named Lorraine Martin, and she was the first black employee inside the U.S. Supreme Court building. A uh, fact that I did not know, nor did my older sister know, until 2005, when our mother passed away. Our mother's father was born at the very tail end of slavery and worked for the government of the District of Columbia, designing and working on the roads and, and highway systems at the time. Uh, my mother would end up protesting outside of buildings that her mother worked in that her father could not even enter. My mother was sent to a private school in rural Pennsylvania when she was eight years old, and she didn't like it. I know because she wrote letters <laughs> that I will now share with you. Dear mother, I am having fun, but I do not like it here. <laughs> now that's code for, I don't like it. I am mad at you. <laughs> Subtext, huge among eight-year-olds. 
Please send me some cookies and a Sparkle Plenty doll. Please send it because I do not have anything to play with. Yours truly, Arnita. That's a sad letter. Why am I showing you a sad letter from my mom's childhood? Because the letter's not ended. Her letter's over, but the letter that her mother received was just beginning. You turn this page over, and there is this other letter. If your little girl is dissatisfied, we'd be glad to have her bed for children who are anxious to come. Right? Signed, Sister. What you are looking at, ladies and gentlemen, is an early prototype of the NSA wiretapping program. <laughs> Circa 1948. It turns out it's a clear and present danger to these United States when a little black girl wants cookies and a doll. Because she might want voting rights and equal pay next. And that's a slippery slope. Her sister is on it. Asked my mom in high school, dressed very appropriately for the times, a, a dress cut below the knees, a basket presumably filled with positive, affirmative thoughts toward the great American democratic experiment. <laughs> she didn't stay looking like that. This is my mom and her friends gathered marching south on 16th Street Northwest outside of what is now known as Malcolm X Park, in a 1968 African Liberation Day parade. Most people in a march look forward. You don't want to trip over someone. You want to keep your eyes on the proverbial prize, but my mother <laughs> looks at you. <laughs> she knew she might end up in a PowerPoint someday. <laughs> when you have a mother like this, it affects the media that you consume as a child. I did not have typical Saturday morning cartoons. I did not read typical pop-up books, see Dick or Jane do simple verb thing and move on with your life. The very first book I can remember reading as a child was this. That'll fuck you up a little bit. <laughs> got me on my stoop protesting Cocoa Puffs because they got to be racist. I don't know how. But these messages get in. This is a shot uh, outside the home. This is what I like to call local grassroots economic activity. <laughs> it was very popular in the early 90s in the Columbia Heights neighborhood. Uh, now white people are very popular uh, in that same <laughs> neighborhood. It's different, different strokes, different strokes, different strokes. <laughs> Family photo, middle school. I uh, went to the Sidwell Friends School from 7th through 12th grade. My mother is pictured in the middle. My older sister, Belinda, is uh, with her back to me. She's in Lansing, Michigan. She uh, was in the newspaper business for 25 years. In fact, when she took her job as the assistant managing editor of the Lansing State Journal, she was one of 25 black assistant managing editors in America. And the year was not 1800 anything. Uh, it was very recently. Now she, she left the newspaper world to start a yoga studio, a donation-based yoga studio in the hood in Lansing. Now you can either take that as a great testament to her community service and commitment to sharing an art with people who truly need it, not just those who could afford it, or you could take it as a massive indictment about the prospects for journalism in these United States. <laughs> I give you choices. I give you choices. Uh, since then, I've been involved in, learned from, and helped create a few uh, very interesting institutions and organizations. I, I studied at the Improv Olympic in Chicago for a summer, which was so great. Uh, as a child, I was in actually a childhood theater company called City at Peace, which got teenagers to write their own stories. Give it up, yeah. One person who knows it and the rest because I told you to. Thank you. Um, you heard some of the other stuff uh, in the bio. And I do have a podcast that's very new. It's called Our National Conversation about conversations uh, about race. Uh, we don't have much to talk about. 
Uh, most significantly over the past few years, I've been spending time uh, building this institution, Cultivated Wit. Several of my Onion colleagues and I left to uh, advance the cause of comedy and storytelling and technology and try to bring those together more. The name was inspired by an old poet from Rome uh, named Horace who said these words, a cultivated wit, one that badgers less can persuade all the more. And so we're trying to take that power of humor to connect uh, with the power of technology to amplify and, and bridge them together. It's often easier to hear such a message. Along the way, I've learned a few things, and I uh, want to share some of those lessons with you. Uh, the first has to do with kind of a general life lesson that sounds obvious, and then you play it out, and it gets more interesting. Uh, having a clear identity and point of view, many of you run theatrical organizations, you are on stages yourself. When I joined this theatrical organization, America's finest news source known as The Onion, I thought I got it. And people often say, uh, this is such an onion story. You know, and those people are always wrong. Uh, it, it's never what they think it is. Most people think, oh, it's politically absurd. Uh, it's goofy. It, it's, it makes fun of a president. Therefore, it must be in the pages of the onion. And what the onion did very creatively is they invented a mythology, their own fake history, to ground everything the onion ever does back in that history. Now, the history of the onion is one of a, of a Prussian tuber farmer uh, who immigrated to this country and knew only two words of English, the and onion. <laughs> he saw an opportunity to monetize attention by pimping out readers to advertisers, and the rest is history. Uh, the onion's modus operandi has been as media satire, as an all-seeing, all-knowing, condescending eye whose motto is Latin for you are dumb. <laughs> All the news that's fits a print versus you are dumb. And from that comes a lot of the humor out of those pages, regardless of the platform that that humor exists on. Now, when I wrote this book, I tried to channel some of that mythology, some of that grounding essence into a message that I thought would be as clear and as effective as what I learned from The Onion. And my scientists, <laughs> my scientists came up with this. It's true, it's true. So who are you is really the only question that matters in life in general. Um, there are fun ways to, to play that I have learned, uh, some formally, some informally, some by accident. I want to share a couple of those cases with you. Uh, I wrote a book that was weird for me. I was a product of the internet. I blogged and tweeted and I silenced my phone before I came into large <laughs> public events because of the mother that she saw who raised me so right. Uh, but this book is, a, is an act of absurdity. There's no way to be black, so let's write a book about that. And it's mostly a memoir, but it's also um, a bit of lessons learned along the way. There's chapters like how to be the black friend, uh, how to speak for all black people, which I'm doing <laughs> right now. This is exhibit A. And uh, how to be the next black president. You know, so I'm looking into the future uh, as well. I also knew that the question was too big for just my own experience to adequately address. And so I built a panel of experts who I called my black panel. And these were uh, black people. That's it. They, that was the requirement. They were black people. <laughs> And they had lifetimes of a combined experience in blackness. And, and so I recorded my interviews with the, the black panel. I asked them questions like, when did you first realize you were black? How black are you? Can you swim? Like science-based <laughs> queries to really um, get at the heart of it. And because I'm a scientist, I also had a control group. And so there were three black women, three black men, coastal and Midwestern representation, um, plus the diaspora also represented outside of these United States, uh, but one white Canadian man uh, served as, as my control group. That was <laughs> Christian Lander. He wrote the book Stuff White People Like, and I figured if anybody knows white people, it's the guy who wrote that. So here's a little snippet of some of what they shared. I came home 
home, and I remember I couldn't really move past the entrance of the house, and I needed to talk about the fact that this little girl said that I was black, and that I, in fact, found myself to be beige. I was playing doctor with a bunch of kids, and, uh, and this one girl, it was her turn to kiss me, and she didn't, and she sort of ran away laughing, and the kids ran away laughing, and the thing I realized at that point that that I was black and they were all white because this was a small private school in Boston. And that was the first time I remember feeling like black was somehow separate from the norm. You know, I think I knew I was black before then because as I say in my show, my mom would not have let me not know I was black. <laughs> there would have been no way that she would have let that information slip. Uh, it's cold outside, take a jacket, and you're black. I was born in Africa, so everybody's black. <laughs> so. We don't really think about it like that. I mean, here he goes like, yeah, I mean, oh, so is he black? Is he white? Is he black? Is he black? black, black. Africa, like, you don't ask. The assumption is that you're black. Therefore, what becomes more important is other things. What your name is, where do you come from, what language do you speak, what's your culture, what's your tribe, etc. So I know I was black. When I was eight, I moved to the Middle East. I think the Middle East is the first time I discovered I was black. Because people will come to talk to you and they'll be like, oh, yes, Allah, no, that's Allah, you know, Ibn Allah, Ibn Allah, Ibn Allah. And what does that translate to? That means, oh, this is a black guy. <laughs> I grew up in East Chinatown in Toronto, so it was made very clear that I was Guaylo from a very early... Guaylo being... White ghost. So, you know, I, I know every derogatory term for a white person in Chinese. Important question. Important question. Um, so, so that was. <laughs> I had uh, dreams when I wrote this book about how it would be received. This was not in my dreams, <laughs> but I'm grateful for it. Uh, the cover was designed intentionally to be provocative, to be a bit of a banner, and to put public readers of the book on the spot, make them ask a question, like, hey, what the hell are you doing with that book? Uh, which is what happened to the white man who was carrying this book before just a group of gentle black men inquired about the reasons for possession of such an object. <laughs> Their faces capture the full range of response to the book <laughs> that are possible according to science. <laughs> My favorite is that one. Because <laughs> the others are in some way engaged, like they are excited, they are confused, or they are upset. That's an emotional space. But this guy over here, he's saying, I don't need some book to tell me how to be black, as evidenced by my matching turtleneck <laughs> and my leather jacket and my hat. Go on with that. Go on with that. I've got this. I have not staged the photos that have started to explode from an audience which wasn't exactly intended, but kids across Instagram love to pose with a book called How to Be Black because it doesn't matter if you're black or not. It is ridiculous to hold a book called How to Be Black. If you're black, do you need refresher courses? Is everything... <laughs> Are you okay? Is this like continuing education? Uh, if you're white, do you think that like this makes you a certain thing? And it's a very sad understanding. <laughs> right? <laughs> Sometimes people aren't happy about it. And then uh, last week. <laughs> Last week, <laughs> this great country of ours, this gift that keeps on giving, yet also taking, but giving, but then taking, provided us with an opportunity. And so we've had one award presented already tonight. But I would like to present an award to one of the most incredible performances I have ever seen in my 30 plus years. Lifetime achievement. 
Award. <laughs> Ms. Rachel, someone help her. Someone help her. Yeah, all right. Um, she did inspire something serious in me. She, she went on Today Show this week, and she embraced this term by uh, transracial, which is a bit of a complex term to just start throwing around, given where we're at with transgender rights, et cetera. Um, and she says, I identify as black. And I thought, all right, I could be upset by this, or I could see an opportunity here to change my station uh, in life. So uh, this is me. <laughs> this is this is who I am. When I was a small child, I used to draw dollar signs all around myself. I made it rain invisibly. I am billionaire. <laughs> I love you all. I love you all so much. Um, one other storytelling, fun time experiment that I, I played with was when I wrote this book, I opened up my computer screen to the world to witness the writing from their own desktop. Uh, not entirely, that would be stupid. Um, and I would never have finished the book or be here to talk about it. Uh, but I did an experiment of writing a chapter in public and then as I edited, I had these like office hour windows where you could just tune in. Uh, and see how it goes. Now, it came with chat software, because there is no vanity author software to boost one's ego while one writes <laughs> one's own book. Silicon Valley has solved a lot of problems, uh, but not that one. So I use tech support software, and it allows people to uh, take over your computer when you're writing, which I had to disable many times. Um, and it allows them to talk to you, which is very distracting when you're actually trying to write. So I saved the chat logs, and I wanted to share with you some of what this audience uh, had to say uh, as I was writing this book. Uh, someone from the UK uh, wished he could stay and watch, but it's nearly one in the morning. Uh, someone suggested a, a, ti a title change for a chapter, a chapter about me going to Senegal for the first time. I took that advice. That chapter is actually called Black to Africa. Uh, very clever. Uh, I'm a mixed child of immigrants, and I'm not black, but I look black. Does this mean I'm black? Help! Rachel Dojo was on my chat room. <laughs> uh, you got to add your name. People love to tell you about how bad your spelling is on, on the internet. So that was uh, interesting. There was a hotel reference. They told me not to stay there. This had already happened, uh, but it didn't matter. They, I think they worked at the Holiday Inn in Dedham. So this is like a buzz marketing kind of thing. Um, and there's the, the great uh, payoff. This is awesome. I'm going to tweet about this. And they did, and people were like, yo, come check out this weird show. This dude's writing his book in public. Uh, but the greatest moment from the chat history around this book uh, is this. My girlfriend is Chinese, and I'm half Jamaican, half regular black. I think our kids might end up Dominican or something. What else would they end up as? <laughs> Chairs? Like they're gonna be human children. So I just, I wanna thank this anonymous user for paving a way forward for us as a nation. Um, the, the last area that I kinda wanna talk about has to do with, with technology. Uh, I have played with and been a benefactor of. My mom was a computer programmer, actually, in the early 1980s, before there was a program for that. And uh, she never graduated college, but she found her way into that universe, and that influenced me a lot. Um, so I think about where performance can happen. And does it have to be on a stage? Does it have to be on a screen? Is there a way to interact with it? And I've witnessed some very uh, interesting examples and been a part of a few myself. This is a Google texting software lets you send a text message from your computer. And you can see from the numbers counting down that those are the number of characters you have left in your message. I'm in the second message already. What happens on the third? <laughs> Google judges you. That is delightful. I was like, oh, the Borg is hilarious. This guy jokes. That's really cool. Um, 
at, at Cultivated Wit, we have created this theatrical experience actually called Comedy Hack Day. It's a tech hackathon where des developers would normally be coding on something rather serious over a short amount of time. We pair them with comedians and also with designers to make ridiculous things on purpose and then put them on stage like an Apple keynote uh, about a very ridiculous thing. So some of the ideas people pitched uh, at our last Comedy Hack Day in New York a few weeks ago, uh, there is an app called Look Up. This is a mobile app that just tells you to look up from your fucking phone <laughs> when you're walking down the street. Just a, a life-saving technology, really. Uh, there was Racebook, which is like a special version of Facebook that filtered out all the idiotic, idiotic racist comments that happen after there are racial incidents. Uh, there was Alternative Mint. Mint is a financial software that helps you budget and kind of shows you how you've been spending your money. Alternative Mint shows you what your money would look like if you had made better choices with it. <laughs> uh, well deserved won our San Francisco competition. This is an online platform that lets you lease your excess privilege. Uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it works. So if you get free lunch at Google but you don't use it, you could put it on the platform. If you're a dude who gets to walk down the street without being catcalled, you could like walk with a woman to prevent that for like five dollars. So it's very, it's empowering. It's like empowering technology. Um, and then there's uh, these guys who built Got This Thing, which is a calendar app. They call it a no ductivity app. And this is for the situation where a friend asks for your help, and you don't have a good reason why you can't help, because you don't actually have anything going on. This auto-populates your calendar with real events from your local area, <laughs> as well as a few made-up ones. So just be like, I am so busy, man. I got this thing. I'm trying out for the X Games, you know, and Cats is playing. I gotta, gotta see Cats, it's Cats, come on. Come on, they'll understand. <laughs> um, and then there's some fun cases that happen in the world where it's not on purpose, it's not crafted, but it, it's, uh, spontaneous in many ways. It's a flash mob meets performance meets the internet. Uh, this is a real place in Texas. Uh, Big Earl's Bait House and Country Store. Uh, Big Earl's does not like to serve homosexuals. And they made it clear with signs like this. Uh, where men act like men, women act like ladies, and no saggy pants. Uh, and then they made this known to a gay couple that was dining. Uh, and the response was beautiful. It wasn't a sit-in, it wasn't a protest, it was much more than a hashtag. It was, let's make Big Earl's the best, biggest, baddest gay dining facility in all of Texas. They took over their Yelp page and they started adding testimonials about how great Big Earl's is if you are gay. And then the media picked up on this. That's not the kind of attention Big Earl wanted. But that's what happens when you hate. That's what happens. The artist will get you. <laughs> the artist with their technology. Uh, last example, The Onion did this story a few years ago. It's an amazing story, I'll, I'll let you digest that. Um, so this is a piece of satire which isn't real. Um, but there were many members of our society who thought it was. Uh, an elected member of Congress thought this was real and posted it to his Facebook page and warned that this is what we fight for, right? <laughs> this is what we're up against. And the reason he did this is because he's an idiot and he didn't use his brain before he clicked a thing. Um, but the Onion audience had fun with this and they did a similar Yelp thing. They created this place on Yelp and started adding reviews to it, very detailed reviews <laughs> that I'm not gonna spend much more time on because I'm pretty much out of time, but it's like, people wanted to be a part of the show. And they didn't ask permission, they just did it. It was beautiful. <laughs> so look, so look, what, what does this all mean? <laughs> um, I have, in some ways, been to the future. I hang out with people who are building fun new tools. I have the luxury of traveling a lot, and, and I have a strong belief that uh, 
the distinction between those on stage and off stage, uh, those who get to choose what goes on stage, is, a, is breaking down. And that powerful metaphor is not just a theatrical one, it's very much the technological one. We have, in some weird way, uh, created a world where antisocial people build all of our social technologies. <laughs> how did that happen? Because we were partying with that guy. That's how it happened. <laughs> so I think it's very important for us uh, in the interactive world, whether that's physically or technologically, uh, to shift that power a little bit to be a lot more inclusive, uh, especially when you're defining tools that determine how we interact with our families, not just how we entertain ourselves. So you guys, I'm honored to be here. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And if there's one last thing uh, that I've learned from our future, uh, it's that it's wonderful and we're all Dominican. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you, Baratunde. That was fantastic. Um, let's see. Oh, here's the great thing. There, yeah, there's a party coming. Um, but also, Baratunde is going to be signing copies of his book in the TCG bookstore. So if you would like to get a copy of, of his book um, and talk to Baratunde for a minute, uh, please do that. Otherwise, we have buses outside that will take you to Pandemonium at TCG. Uh, let me see. Pandemonium at TCG, party at the edge. So those buses are right out on Euclid, so either go get your book signed or go party, and we'll see you all there. Thank you. Thank you.